Hello, listeners. This is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Hotfix. This will be the continuation of Complicated Creation. This will be Part 18, Chapter 12, the second half. Nezu surveys the examination room they have been assigned for this process with a careful eye. It's a decently sized space meant for observation. One wall has a large glass partition where additional machinery is kept, and there is room for more than simply doctor and patient. Two beds have been arranged in the center of the room, crisp linens waiting occupation. Next to them sit two EEG devices, wired and ready, and Nezu recognizes the standard arrangement of pulse and oximeter monitors with the ephemera of things used to ascertain that human baseline is, in fact, remaining so. Behind the glass are machines and computers that will use the room sensors to judge quirk activation, judge power output, and even read the radius of Deku's power. The walls are lined with gofu, marked, Nezu's nose is sensitive enough to pick up on it, with blood. It's subtly done as well. He doubts the humans around him have noticed the fact, or he is sure they would comment. It further adds weight to Deku's beliefs, if he's willing to add something like blood for vermicillitude. It could be subterfuge, of course, designed to convince others, but the subtlety of the markings leads him to suspect it was done in earnest. Of course, there is the consideration to be made that Deku has done so knowing that Nezu himself would read the blood on the papers and make the same judgment about his dedication to this cause. Nezu does not negate the possibility. It is simply a far less likely option, based on current parameters. In the corner of the room, Aizawa speaks with Deku quietly. Nezu can hear the words, even though he knows he is not meant to. They are reassurances, traded between one another. Deku promising to protect himself from his spirits, Aizawa promising to protect Deku from humanity. It is heartening to see the two of them so clearly bonded. It makes things easier. Easier because magic should not exist, certainly, but part of his intelligence means that Nezu himself is aware of how much he still does not know, and how much humanity has yet still to learn. There are gaps, large ones, in quirk knowledge. Too much quirk theory stands on weak foundations and studies that were old fifty years ago, and now creak on ancient legs. Humanity is too squeamish, in his personal and private opinion. It is probably a good thing he did not go into quirk studies himself. Ethics are of course important, but they can be such a roadblock to progress. There are people moving around inside the partitioned room, assistants to the specialists he's called in for this exercise. Ayuki stands beside him, and has been a lifelong friend and confidant, or at least for as long as his life of freedom has existed, and an expert in atypical quirk expression, and a steadfast and logical mind. Roku is speaking with Chatora, and is likewise an expert in quirk factor. He has been the lead specialist dealing with the aftermath of both the Shi Hisaikai and those who have survived falling under all for one's attention. A nurse brings in Tomoko, who looks around the room with a quiet, nervous energy she tries valiantly to hide. She would look well if you did not know her, he thinks to himself. You could consider her color natural if you did not note how valiantly her makeup has been applied to adjust for it. The lines and bruises around her eyes have been deftly concealed, and her smile is the practiced, comforting expression of a rescue hero. She could be well, if you did not account for the weight loss, the lethargy, the unexplained chronic pain, the moments of confusion. She could be well, if you did not hear Chatora explain the inability to handle groups or crowds, the fear of being alone, the nightmares and cataplexy. He does not know what Deku sees when he walks up to her, but there is something. The boy is brilliant at reading others in very short periods of time, and Nezu watches as he first almost bounds up to the older woman and then softens himself in the space between two breaths, and he speaks to her more as he does Eri, more as he does to the spirit he calls Tamamonome, the way he addresses Aizawa. It's nice to meet you, Deku tells her with a genuine smile. I don't know what everyone's told you. You're going to see if you can help with my quirk. Her smile nearly matches his. Chatora told me, because you fixed Mirio's quirk. I'm going to try, Deku nods and explains what limitations they might have, since he hasn't dealt with quite the situation before. Of course, he has apparently dealt with quite a few different situations over the last few years. Nezu had sat with him and carefully drawn out story after story about fixing quirks, up to and including removing them. Deku calls it disconnecting, of course, but the result is the same. 
Most of the cases are hard to follow up on, of course. Deku rarely had names to offer. But a few of the descriptions of quirks and ages, especially regarding children, had brought some result. And money, especially in a place like Kotobukicho, could encourage all sorts of memories to surface. There's no real understanding of Deku's ability or limits, not even from the boy himself. And then, of course, there's the case of young Yuna to consider, or what he has done for Eri and Mirio. Both happened under Nezu's careful gaze and Yue's censors, what little they have been able to pick up, and still, they do not know anything near enough. Really, when faced with an ability like Deku's, Tomoko's condition, as regrettable as it is, is a perfect chance to study what he can do, and potentially examine the limits. They are miles from Tartarus, all for one is well and truly contained, and the machinery here is far better at picking up nuance than the more simple machinery at Yue, as this is not obligated to be hidden. As unethical as it might be, Deku's quirk or ability works needs to be studied, and the sooner the better. If he can be influenced by outside quirks or spirits, then they need a solid plan of action to protect him. And if he is, in the unlikely event, playing a very long game, or falls into the hands of those less scrupulous than UA's staff, then they need a better idea of how to stop someone with his kind of power. Izuku sits on the medical bed with his legs hanging over the side, while everyone moves in organized chaos around him. There's a plastic band around his forehead that sits behind his ears, and wires trail down from it. Other wires are stuck to his temples and the back of his neck, and even in his hair. The adhesive, a little itchy, and they all trail to a machine at the side of his bed. There is a monitor on his finger for his pulse, and a few other things on his arms and chest that he honestly doesn't recognize. Tomoko has the same treatment, looking nervous and bouncing slightly, leaning into Chitora while the doctors make sure everything is working. The spirits all around him are reassuring. He's met the three spirits of the wild, wild pussycats, all of them cat-themed, which makes him wonder if they'd already had that form or chose it to match their humans. And Sun Eater's octopus, Oku, is hovering in the corner just in case. Izuku's not calling on his power now, just in case it makes the process of all these machines harder, but he'd eaten some canned clams before they started to show Aizawa that he really could armor himself, just in case, and that it worked out well. Tama Monome didn't say very much at all when she arrived, but she'd given him a smile. So maybe she doesn't hate him after all. He's not brave enough to ask her yet, though. It's enough that she's here to help. All right, Dr. Ayuki says, and it's frightening to be here, and to be dealing with doctors and to be on this bed, but it's not too much. He's doing it for Tomoko, and he's doing it for himself, and no one has called him crazy yet, and Aizawa promised no one would. Now, from my understanding, you use your quirk to reach and read someone else's quirk factor through a mark on your hands. Can you give us a brief example so we can ensure that everything is calibrated? Izuku nods, but Nezu interrupts. Actually, he says from his position, standing on a chair so that he's of the same height as everyone else, which would look silly on anyone else, but just makes perfect sense for him. Deku, if you would, could you simply reach for our spirit first? Not Miss Tomoko. Okay. Izuku looks at his options and hesitates because he doesn't want to overstep and he and Tama Monome haven't talked, so he settles on Oku. How about I just armor my legs? What? Izuku just asks and receives the spirit's power as it floats down to him, his lower legs gaining a thick layer of hard calcium around them, though not so much to rip his pants. The plan is to tug up his pants leg to show them, but of course, the minute he actually starts to channel Oku's power, everything starts to scream. He stops, and the machines, save for one, all stop blaring alarms. But the one that keeps alarming is so loud that he has to cover his ears against it, and his heart is pounding, and he can smell antiseptic, and he's cold, and it's suddenly very, very hard to breathe. Warm hands cover his, and someone shouts, and the noise stops. Izuku smells cologne. No one wore cologne at the Institute. There were rules against it. And he looks up and Aizawa's in front of him, covering his ears still and giving him a worried look. You all right? He asks, lips moving slowly enough for Izuku to read them. He doesn't take his hands off of Izuku's own, off of his ears, blocking out the sound. Izuku shudders and breathes in deep. The cologne is stronger than the smell of the hospital this close and smells fresh, like Aizawa just put it on. He feels his eyes water. 
Did he seriously put on cologne for me? He asks Tamoma no May. He is prepared for you, kid. If you are doing this, you are doing it as protected as he can make you. Izuku would give anything to be alone with Aizawa for five minutes just to ask for a hug. But there are too many people, too many spirits, so he breathes again and nods, tugging his hands free. Sorry, he says to Aizawa, but really to the whole room. That was loud. It startled me too, Tomoko says instantly, and Izuku notices she's clutching her hands together, so it probably isn't just her trying to make him feel better. What? What was it? Told you it was going to be a problem, Aizawa says, hand on Izuku's shoulder now, and glaring at Nezu. If he disappears from camera feeds, he's going to interrupt things here. But not audio recordings, Nezu points out. We should not proceed assuming that nothing will work, Aizawa, but rather that everything should work, and then calibrate based on actual empirical evidence, should we not? Aizawa says something under his breath that Izuku catches as, we shouldn't be doing this at all. But he doesn't say it loud enough for Nezu to respond, so everyone pretends he didn't say anything at all. They have to fiddle with the machinery, which makes Izuku nervous, which makes Aizawa hover closer and squeeze his shoulder more. Everyone waits until Dr. Ayuki nods and says, Try again. Less screaming machinery, but the one that's connected to all the wires in his head still just goes off and keeps going until they unplug it. It takes three separate tries before Zuku can use Oku's power, showing off his armored shins to frustratingly annoying surprise from the doctors, and he feels jumpy and wound tight like a spring when they finally declare themselves ready for him to try to do something more like, you know, actually help Tomoko. He's too wound up to even ask what the heck has been going wrong. He'll ask later, if he has the energy to. He just wants this to be done with, wants answers for himself and to chase away the empty look in Ragdoll's eyes. So, it's maybe with a bit of stubbornness, a bit of pride, and a bit of desperation when he marks Tomoko's hand with the borrowed sharpie he's kept from the other place, and then his own. It's a bit of determination to do this, and do this right, that when he reaches towards her and hears the machinery scream again, he decides to ignore it and just keep going. Tomoko is a jungle, at first glance, but one that looks, Izuku has to search for the word, desiccated. It looks like a bomb has gone off all at once, and everything around him is dead. Her core exists and thrums under his feet, but everything he can see is just... empty. When he reaches to touch a vine that hangs down over his head, it turns to dust and collapses into itself, disintegrating into nothing. It is unlike anything he has ever seen before, even when a spirit dies while connected to someone rare, but it does happen. Their human keeps a pool of their power. That pool empties, eventually, without the spirit's connection, but it is there. Even All Might, who had his spirit move on, still has power within him, however weakened. Ragdoll is empty. There is nothing inside of her, nothing of her spirit or its power or her quirk, except... Izuku doesn't see the spiderweb thin line. There would be no way to see it with his eyes, a thread in this place of death, but he can feel it. He walks trying to disturb as little as he can, ignoring the way someone is trying to tug on his body, pushing that sensation away as unimportant. He's somewhere safe, for the moment, and Aizawa's looking after him. He tugs on the thread. It feels solid. It feels like a spirit's connection just spun impossibly thin. He knows, somehow, just by touching it, that it cannot be broken by his touch, but that he could break it if he chose to. He knows, without knowing quite how that it leads somewhere wrong. Like this, inside of Ragdoll, he is grounded and centered and contained. The thread leads outside of her. The thread, he knows, leads to all for one. He's never tried to be anywhere but inside himself or inside of someone else. He's never wanted to leave his body at risk like that. There were plenty of stories in the Grand Library about spirit walking, or monks projecting their spirit far and wide, and all sorts of stories about what could happen if your body was left as an empty shell for anything else to enter. But the hospital room is warded, and he is protected, and he has to know. Izuku lets his grip on Ragdoll go, but does not follow the firm band of power behind him back to his body. He floats, and tugs on the spiderweb experimentally, and flies. It is breathtaking. He can't breathe, which he doesn't need to do like this, but always tries to because it's more comfortable to pretend to have a body. 
He passes through the ceiling, through several floors of people and things, and the roof, and then he's scrambling to hold on to the thread as he is pulled away from the hospital, heading east. He's moving too fast. He tries to slow himself down, but he can't. The line in his hand is vibrating, and he can't let go. It's pulling him now, away from his body, away from the safety of his wards and protections, away from Aizawa and the spirits who had agreed to protect him, terrifyingly away from it all. And dragged towards the giant shape of Tartarus that looms on the horizon and gets closer as the world around him blurs with speed. The Greeks thought of Tartarus as a dank and desolate place, where those who had crossed the gods and done the unthinkable were held. For most of its occupants, it stood as a sentence of eternity, of toil and despair and futility, a place even the gods themselves would not wish to visit, a place of the eternally damned and the morally corrupt, where Sisyphus endlessly pushed his burden and where Ixion lies forever strapped to a burning wheel. The walls of Tartarus are meant to keep everyone and everything in or out, depending on their position. It is a building made by quirks, quirked construction to make a fortress that can withstand tsunami, flooding, earthquakes, and mere mortal attempts to enter or leave. Security installed by quirked individuals, fine-tuned by them, and watched by them. Sensors monitor every living being inside of the building, their heart rate, their temperature, their power levels, their REM sleep, and their bowel movements. There is no privacy. There is no freedom. There is no doubt that every prisoner deserves their fate. Tartarus stands as an impenetrable fortress where only the truly despicable and truly dangerous are placed and kept under constant, unblinking surveillance. Izuku flies ever closer overhead, struggling to free himself to no avail. Inexorable force holds him in its grip, and he stops for a moment only when he is hovering a few dozen feet above the center of the cold, gray prison. He tries once more to pull away, to hold on to his sense of self and return to his own body. But the grip around him refuses to let go. They drag him down. Izuku lands in chaos. It's loud, too loud, and possibly overwhelmingly awful, and oppressive, and he hurts, he's suffocating. He's pressed down and smothered, and there's screaming, no, not screaming, wailing, begging cries, and his voice joins them without thought, without reason, just... Please, 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 please. Help us. He doesn't know how long he's lost in the sensation, but at some point the line in his hand, that is still attached to his hand, tugs and tugs and drags him along the ground. The sensation, of sorts, reminds him of where he is, reminds him of who he is, and that these feelings are not his own. It is hard, incredibly hard, to find the space where he ends and the thoughts of so many spirits begin, but he finds that edge and rebuilds his mental walls until the cacophony is only a dull roar until he can scrape himself up, dizzy and uneasy and afraid of what he'll find, where he'll be. He staggers upright in a room that is bright and circular, with a man strapped vertically to a medical bed like a horrific Frankenstein's monster, hooked up to tubes and wires and machinery, with what looks like machine guns lining the ceiling of the room aimed at him. And part of Izuka's brain thinks, that's all for one. That's All Might's nemesis. That's what you're going to become. But it's a very quiet part of his brain, because the rest of his head is screaming and gibbering, horrified, point-blank, disgusted terror. Wrapped around the human, only for Izuku's eyes to see, is something that, once upon a time, was a dragon. Help us. If this mental sense of self could throw up, it would. The dragon is huge, maybe three times the size of Mizuchi, blue and silver and gold. Izuka doesn't doubt that he was beautiful once. Now. Save us. Now there is the bloated, bulging, disfigured shape of something that can only be identified as a dragon because its head is mostly intact, and Izuka can't think of anything else with the body that long with legs but gods. By all the gods. I smell you, it says menacingly. And as Izuku takes an unwilling step forward, he realizes the dragon is blind. Or at least, its one eye is clouded over and unblinking. The other is nothing but a tumor. I smell you, human. I know you are here. Do you think you can hide? Do you think I would not recognize you? The voice is male, but tired, in a way Izuku has not heard from a spirit ever. 
It makes him feel exhausted just hearing it. He has to shake the feeling off, strengthen the difference between it, them, and himself. What happened to you? he asks, even as he takes in everything and knows the answer to that fact. The dragon's form is littered with growths, tumors, bulges, many scaled over, many just part of its body distorted as it is, but not all. No, not all. The line in his hand tugs once more, and Izuku walks before he is dragged closer to one of the dragon's front legs. This one stuck in position because there is another spirit merged into his side and next to, and across the top of the leg, preventing it from moving. It's a large cat, with huge ears and spotted fur, and half of it is just merged into the dragon. Its front legs are free, but its back and bottom half are just covered by scales. The dragon is absorbing it, slowly. The cat's front paws reach out, and the line tugs him in, and Izuku touches fur and the walls around his mind collapse. Help us. Save us. Release me. Get me out of here. Oh, gods, please. I'll pay anything. Anything. Give anything. Help us. Help me. I can't. I can't. Izuku feels himself bend under the pressure, feels the fracture spread across his mental frame, feels himself begin to fragment under the power of a hundred, two hundred, how many voices? Some loud and thunderous and some sputtering like a dying flame, and every one of them desperate and hurting and clawing and demanding and afraid, so very, very afraid. For a moment, he loses himself. For a moment, he is adrift in a sea of noise and pain, a speck of dust in a storm. For a moment he feels his edges start to warp, and if he could see, he would realize his hands are beginning to sink into the cat, his whole body following inexorably forward. He cannot give up here. Some small, furious part of himself protests. He will not lose himself. His power flares, explosively filling him from his chest to his fingertips and then further, brighter, making him bigger. The voices scream, and Izuku screams back, but this time it echoes with his power, his magic, his very soul. Shut up! The world goes white. Izuku feels spread out, thin and brittle in pieces, until he pulls himself together, like gathering a giant blanket and bundling it up against his chest. By the time he feels like himself, his mental self at least, the world around them has resolved, at least somewhat. It is white. Everything is white. There is no floor or walls or ceiling, but he's standing on a surface nonetheless, and there seems to be gravity, and it doesn't feel like the real world, but it doesn't feel like the other place either. In front of him curls the spirit of all for one, but, but the human is nowhere to be found. Where's all for one? he asks, before he realizes he's speaking, looking around and wondering if he'll be attacked, if the human was elsewhere, like Izuku is now, and might come back now that they've made a fuss. The spirits, the other spirits, are at least quieter. Why? the dragon asks, and then there's a mental laugh from it that hurts what Izuku would think of as his bones, if this form had them, a deep and powerful ache. Did you think he and you would meet? It, he, if Izuku judges by his voice, asks. That you would kill him, and take us as your rightful prize. Izuku takes a step back, confused. I... I don't... know. I thought... Mizuji said we were... The whole body of the dragon thrashes, and the ache in Izuku's arms and legs grows. Is it not enough to claim one of us that you must have two? How much more can you glut yourself? How dare... The bridge. He's a bridge. Another like before. Save us. Save me. Kill him. The voices begin to grow louder and Izuku can't take it a second time. Stop it, he demands, putting power in the words. He can't, he won't, deal with being blamed for things he has not done here. I haven't done anything to Mizuchi, he tells the stunned dragon as the other spirits quiet. He's in the world with his human right now. I came here. He takes a breath, even though he doesn't need one, and puts truth into his words. I came here because I'm the bridge. Or a bridge, that's what everyone says, and... And I don't really know what that means. I came here because they told me that Ragdoll's quirk, her spirit, was here, and I wanted to save her and see... See what Mizuchi meant. That I was like all for one. Is he... 
In the space of being able to think and not simply react, Izuku realizes something. If one for all is a complete melting, multiple spirits becoming one, all for one is. He did this to you, he breathes out, horrified all over again, when he comprehends just what his horrible legacy is supposed to be. This is... This is what they think of when they see him, Izuku realizes. This is why the spirits are so afraid. Maybe they never wanted him to ever truly know to try to prevent him from doing exactly this, and yet this is a dragon, and Izuku knows how powerful he should be. Why couldn't you stop him? The dragon turns, struggling for a moment until warped and disfigured legs can tuck under his form, until he can turn his giant snout in Izuku's direction, until said snout is inches away from Izuku's face, breath hot and repugnant. By the time I thought I should, child, I was too late. I was as trapped as any of the others, and he would not die. Izuku stares at the tumor on the side of the dragon's mouth. If he looks closely with more than his eyes, he can see the spirit curled inside and slowly being crushed. This is wrong, he says it, knows it, feels it, even in this strange nothing space. Can I help them? If I'm like him, can I? Can I undo it? There's silence, and then a roar of, Help us! That staggers Izuku back, hands covering his ears, even if it doesn't actually help against the sound. This time, it's the dragon that quiets them in turn, and Izuku looks up to see one cloudy eye staring at him, the dragon's whole head moving to try to get a view of some sort. Who are you, child? And isn't that the question of the hour? Izuku laughs softly. My name's Deku. I don't enslave spirits, not even the ones who hurt me. I... If I can help you, I'd like to. I will, if you let me. You look like you're hurting, and I can feel everyone else is. I... I don't know if I can, but there has to be something I can do. The dragon's tongue flicks out and runs over swollen gums, considering or tasting the air, Izuku isn't sure. But eventually, it lets its head down on the invisible floor and Izuku finally gets a solid idea of how exhausted it must be, carrying the extra weight and the screaming minds of spirits for centuries. I do not know if you can help, he says, the aggression bleeding out of him. I do not know if anything save his death would help. But if you can free them, you would free me. Do what you can. Do what you must. I cannot stop you he admits, then pauses thoughtful. Mizuchi sent you, he sighs. That was reckless. Izuku, now that he can, walks around the dragon. He didn't exactly send me. We... It was a weird conversation we had when he realized I didn't know why everyone hated me. Because they thought I was like your human. Um, speaking of, will he... All for one. Will he show up here? wherever here is. I don't want to start and have him come in or hurt you more. If he's stronger than me, we should make a plan. The dragon huffs, a confused sound, before he shakes his head. He cannot come here. He cannot see or hear us any longer. He shut us out years ago. Izuku's initial reaction of, wait, I could shut you out, does not, at this exact moment, sound like the right thing to say. Maybe something to investigate later, but for the moment, there are more important things to worry about. He heads back towards Ragdoll's spirit, which looks at him with wide, dark, pleading eyes. She's, he's pretty sure the cat is a she, paws at the air as he approaches. Everyone needs to stay calm, he tells her, and hopefully the rest of the spirits that are listening. If you overwhelm me, I can't do anything. The sound of agreement is a susurration instead of a cacophony, a good start. How do you know Mizuchi? Izuku asks the dragon while trying to examine where the spirits are joined. Usually he'd just reach with his power, but right now he's pretty sure he is his power, and that's not confusing at all, of course not. He is my brother, the dragon answers. I forbade him from ever seeing me like this. Well, no wonder Misuchi hated him at first sight, as Izuku thinks. It would have helped if someone had said so, but saying so and spirits seem to be a shitty combination. 
He's probably worried about you, Izuku offers, but he's not really focused on the conversation. His hands itch. Everything about the dragon is wrong to him, and the longer he stands in its presence, the worse he feels and all he really wants to do is... He sets his hands on the cat's beard once more, this time under her front legs. He isn't exactly thinking about things, and maybe that's for the best, because all he wants to do is save her and the others and reunite her with Ragdoll, and he pulls. The cat, Hashi, he suddenly knows, tears away from the dragon's side, literally. Izuku stares at the gaping hole in horror, even as Hashi licks a terribly rough tongue up his cheek. Thank you, she says, and then she disappears. Back to Ragdoll, he can only hope, but his attention is still on the open wound in the dragon's side where the cat's spirit had been. It doesn't bleed, but that's the only saving grace it has. Izuku sets his hands on either side and tries to see if he can maybe heal it, but the dragon rolls out of his reach. Leave it the dragon orders, rolling back a moment later. It's a flesh wound. I am far stronger than that. Cut out the rest, child. That is said with a bit more force and, if Izuku wants to label anything, desperation. Save your energy to deal with them and free me from this curse. Quickly. The words echo in his head. He's sure the other spirits are clamoring again, but Izuku doesn't quite hear them. He has to free them, has to free this dragon, has to keep working as quickly as he can. He reaches for the next spirit, a tiny ball of white flame, buried directly under the dragon's thick hide. The scales split under his hands, but he doesn't stop to think about it. Doesn't stop to think about anything. Later, much later, he'll realize that a human with the power of a hundred or more spirits might mean a spirit with such power as well, but it is far too late to change things by then. He has a job. He has a duty. This was what he was made for to set things right. Shota watches Deku with genuine fear. Whatever he's done, whatever he's doing, Deku's not responding to any of them, and apparently half of the monitoring devices have just stopped even trying to do their jobs. He does not say, I told you so again, because there's no point, but he is glaring at Nezu with all of his power. He keeps it to Nezu, however, because he has to at least admit that Ragdoll, Tomoko, looks about as bad as had been implied, and while he's angry about all of this, he's not going to be the one to make her worse. This could have been done better in a dozen different ways, but they're here now, and all he can do is wait and hope that the help Deku had promised he'd have would be enough. He waits. He waits and waits, and the clock ticks by and nothing changes. Tomoko and Totora speak quietly. The doctors flurry around the machinery. Shota keeps himself firmly planted two feet away from Deku, leaning against the wall but in plain sight because... Deku sometimes comes back disoriented, and he doesn't want the kid to see hospital whites in panic. They wait. The first sign something is wrong is just a shadow in the corner of his eye that Aizawa looks at directly, only to have it disappear. The first time means nothing, could be anything at all, but the sixth time it happens is a problem. He wonders if anyone else is picking up on it and realizes Nezu's sharp gaze is slowly canvassing the room from one side to the other. You saying things, too. I am picking up on the impression of something, certainly, but it is a visual cue only, says the principal, his nose doing that scrunch thing when he tests the air. You have a fine taste in cologne, Aizawa. Shota decides to let that slide for now. The flickering gets stronger, and he stops trying to look at it head on. It's been almost half an hour, twice as long as any of Deku's other sessions, and still he hasn't twitched, not even when Dr. Ayuki pricked his finger. Shota does not want to think about what that might mean exactly, so he focuses on the shadow shapes. If he doesn't look directly, they don't seem to disappear. Tomoko gasps, her whole body jerking with a start, and her monitors go off in various loud, beeping ways. Chatora gathers her to his chest, and she shakes, looking around at the doctors. Then to Shota, who, hell, she can probably read how frustrated and upset he is right now, if he's guessing right. It's back! She says, tears glittering in her eyes, but they do not spill. It's back. I can feel... I can feel everyone. I can... She blinks and stares at Deku, expression shifting from relief to a worried frown, as her lips press together. He's... What's wrong? Shota demands, sharper than he ought to be. Tomoko shakes her head. He's not inside himself. 
I don't know where he is, but... Deku glows. It is a flash for only a moment, but it fills the room with light that has a physical presence. When it passes, Shota blinks and the shadows that had hovered just out of sight resolve themselves into spirits. A lot of spirits. To say that everyone reacts badly is a bit of an understatement. Both doctors jump back, possibly because of their proximity to a quartet of wildcats, a tiger, some sort of desert-looking cat, something huge and white, something smaller with far too sharp-looking teeth, all standing around Totora and Tomoko, who at least seem to take their namesake in some sort of stride. They just freeze up. Nezu, however, only freezes after he has managed a death hold on Shota's scarf, tucked into the folds of it and tiny black paws digging sharply into Shota's back. All things considered, Shota has to grant that it is probably the principal's best course of action. Of course, those aren't the only spirits. There's a strange multicolored octopus thing floating above their heads, and there's, thank everything, Tamomu no Mei. Seriously. Thank fuck, he says to her directly, despite the fact that he knows she should not be visible. He's not going to question it yet. Is Deku okay? What's happening? She says something. He doesn't hear her. Well, fuck. We've got visual but no sound, he tells her, as she seems to realize he can see her, shifting back and forth half phase through a chair. So we're playing charades. Do you know where Deku is? She shakes her head, human-shaped at the moment, so at least she isn't taking up too much space. Another flash of light, and a ball of white fire appears, flying around the room frantically, followed by a one-eyed, 2D black shadow thing, followed by what showed us pretty sure is a porcupine. Oh, fuck, he breathes out, staring at Deku and then to Taomomo no Mei. He's... he's freeing spirits, isn't he? Because... because how did they not see it? It's so fucking obvious. If he was doing something to find Tomoko's spirit, then if there were others that needed help. Fuck. Even he'd forgotten the finer points of how Deku's world worked. It was easy to think that distance made space for people and that Deku would be safe with guardians. Well, maybe not easy. He'd been worried about something coming after Deku this whole time. He hadn't considered Deku going to them. Tamomonome nods and then winces as a series of lights like fireflies, tiny balls that slam into the walls and doors and windows over and over again appear. She says something, but Shota still can't hear her, and his lip-reading is good, but not that good, when he doesn't have context clues at all. And then one of the fairy lights slam into Tamomonome from the back. She staggers, and so does Shota. He very nearly falls, but he catches himself on the wall. Literally. He catches himself with the six-inch metal claw nails he now has extending from the ends of his fingers. Nezu peers out from over his shoulder. Interesting he says, in a voice that Shota thinks is the most unnerved that he has ever heard from the principal. Aizawa looks over at Chatora and Tomoko, the two of them staring at Chatora's now flaming hair and Tomoko's glittering skin. Dr. Ayuki and Dr. Roku are staring in equal horror and scholarly fascination as they try to keep Dr. Ayuki's feet on the ground, instead of floating a few inches away from it. I'm just going to say it, Aizawa says as he yanks on his left hand, until he can free his new claws from the wall. They seem exceptionally sharp when he tests them gently with the pad of his thumb. Hopefully, this is short-term or retractable, otherwise marking is going to be hell. I told you this was a bad idea. Izuku feels like he's floating. Separating out the hundreds of spirits is draining, but he can't stop. He can't stop because the dragon will not allow him to stop. The dragon, and somewhere in all of this with blood on his hands, Izuku knows that this is Ryujin, has learned this name the way he's already gathered hundreds of others, has him under a command. Ryujin orders him to cut out the spirits that plague his frame, and so he does. Their common names pass through Izuku's hands, and their true names echo behind, offering themselves up for the taking, floating tantalizingly close. He does not reach for them. He moves on to the next spirit, the next cry for help, the overwhelming noise of everyone together slowly growing weaker as more and more voices leave them to go somewhere else. Some of the spirits are so weak, they can't find their way out, they cling to him, lost and afraid, afraid of him, and yet more afraid of going back to where they were. They are not truly themselves anymore, Izuku thinks, 
They've been drained nearly dry until they are just echoes of what they had once been. Until they are a single power, a quirk, and nothing else. Those he nudges along, only paying half a mind to them in the process, telling them to use his tether back to himself as a guide, the way he'd used Hashi's connection to Ragdoll to come here, the way Hashi had used her connection to pull Izuku along. He doesn't know how long he works, how many names he's learned, or how many spirits he's freed. There's no real sense of anything but the next cry for help, and the next, and the next, and Ryujin twisting himself for Izuku to have access to the countless bodies that litter his sides. When Izuku's hands reach for the next spirit and find nothing, he blinks into awareness. There is silence. The spirits are gone. The pressure of their demands, their needs, their cries for help all soothed into nothingness. He stands and stares at his hands and realizes they are covered in blood. Ryujin lays on his side, head curled towards Izuku, his one eye half-lidded, the other a gaping wound where a spirit had been, to match the hundreds of others, some deep, some shallow, that carve up the dragon from nose to tail. Izuku wavers. He feels himself sway, and it's as though his own shape is hard to hold, like his edges are blurry, and he wants to cry. I am sorry, Ryujin says, voice quiet. I did not want to risk that he would stop halfway. But you've used too much. Izuku goes from standing to sitting, without any motion between. His form simply changes. He leans against Ryujin's neck, one small bare space without injury. I need... He says the word slow, like they're made out of syrup. I need to... Fix you. You're hurt. He knows how to heal. He doesn't have much power, though, and this is... This is terrible. He did this. He has to fix this. It's his job to fix things. That's what he's good for. That's all he's good for. I hurt you. Child. Ryujin's voice is like water, Izuku thinks. Cool and calming. Mizuchi's voice is like a raging river, but Ryujin's is nice. Child, I bade you and you obeyed. And that you did not fight me tells me all too much. I have seen your mind, child. I have seen your heart. Listen to me. Listen to the words I say. Izuku nods. He can do that. He can listen. A bridge is not simply the path between two points, child. A bridge can also be the anchor on each side that connects them. A bridge is not just the stones it is made of, it is the purpose it serves. Izuku nods, again. Okay, he says, so tired now, so empty. It takes energy to hold himself together, and there's almost no one left he has to hold together for. If he lets go, he doesn't know what would happen. Perhaps he'll drift away like the spirits. That sounds nice. Thank you, child. Ryujin shifts, even though he shouldn't even though it must hurt him to do so. He shifts, and Izuku falls from leaning against his neck and lays on the strange knot ground and stares up at the endless white of the knot sky and wonders if he'll become a spirit when he dies, or if he'll be able to see his mother again. A giant, bloodied snout covers his whole chest. The breath from it is so hot, it almost burns, and then it does burn. Izuku screams as power floods him, more than he's ever held in his life, more than he's ever known. He pushes himself up, suddenly clear-headed and aware, and cries out a second time when he realizes Ryujin is fading. Don't! Izuku demands, hands outstretched, trying and failing to give the power back. Don't! I don't need this! I was supposed to free you! Let me heal you! Don't give up now! He is, in fact, crying, even though he wasn't sure this sense of himself could. Please. He doesn't want to be responsible for the death of a spirit, of a dragon, of someone important. He doesn't want Ryujin to die. He doesn't want to be blamed for it. He doesn't want the one person who might possibly be able to explain things to leave him. He doesn't want to admit how selfish he is. Please, he begs, knowing it's hopeless, when half of the dragon's form is already gone from sight. Please don't go. You freed me. Ryujin says gently. 
You have given me the death I craved, even if I used you to accomplish it. Thank you, child. You will forever have my gratitude. Izuku doesn't get to argue further. Ryojin fades into nothingness and leaves him alone. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 12 of Complicated Creation. Chapter 13, the last and final chapter, which will likely be split up into two parts, will be up next. I hope you all are still enjoying this fic. Let me know your thoughts and reactions to this one. It was a pretty hefty chapter, lots of stuff going on. And as always, thank you all so much for listening.